Okay, so Maria set up um, um, quite a good um, background to my paper. Um, I'm a PhD student here at Cardiff, and one of the reasons I'm interested in chronologies is because for um, the Neolithic period, which is my area of study, we have quite um, uh, a contrast between some sites and some areas and some periods which have incredibly detailed chronologies and others which we don't have anything like that. And it's trying to um, reconcile sites and areas and regions and periods that have very contrasting um, chronologies. And this led me to think about how um, we've got to this stage and what we're doing with um, particularly Bayesian um, dates. Um, I'm not going to be particularly high level, there's a huge amount of theory and statistical background to Bayesian work which I'm not going to go into, but I do think, as Anne said at the beginning, we need to think about how our methodologies are influencing our narratives and, our, and our, the way that we think about um, this period. Um, so as Anne said, it's um, been um, 10 years since the publication of the Chronologies of Early Neolithic Long Barrows project, which is the one that was published in Cambridge um, Archaeological Journal in 2007. Um, which can be credited with bringing to wide attention the possibilities of using Bayesian analysis of radiocarbon dates to create robust and precise chronological models, at least within the context of prehistory in the British Isles. Um, this volume also included interesting and insightful narratives that built on those dates in a, in a very kind of new way to kind of create a brand new story really for this particular period. And since then the methodology has been applied widely in British and Irish archaeology initially um, to the early Neolithic with the Gathering Time project, but more recently to other periods such as the Iron Age and the Anglo-Saxon periods, and its use is spreading across Europe. The result for some periods has been something of a revolution, um, for example in, in the early Neolithic, where the short durations of the use of some prehistoric monuments has come as something of a surprise to archaeologists, and we can now talk about events in terms of lifetimes and generations. So what I'm trying to do here is um, think about how um, interpretation and archaeological theory is using this methodology as it becomes more widely applied across the discipline. It may be something of setting up a bit of a straw man um, in order to knock it down, but I think that might be what TAG is for. Um, and obviously I have huge respect and admiration for the teams behind these projects, um, particularly Alistair Whittle, Alex Bayliss, Rick Shorting and others who are working in this discipline. And I don't mean to kind of um, belittle or kind of criticise them too much because I think the work they do is wonderful but I do think we need to think about what's happening in archaeology. Um, so as Maria's already showed you a diagram that looks um, something like this, this is a flow diagram taken from Alex Bayliss's um, 2009 paper in the journal Radiocarbon um, which sets out the process for conducting a radiocarbon dating project um, using Bayesian chronologies. So it's the process of building and testing models and then publishing those models that best fit the evidence and there's a feedback loop there within the project cycle. And of course, in this, the crucial bit is missing in that there's a feedback loop here where the published models, the narratives and the accounts go on not to, only to inform other regional narratives, theoretical accounts, also help to define future questions and presumably, we haven't quite got to that stage yet, but be um, influential in setting up future Bayesian modelling projects. And that's the crucial bit really, this kind of extra bit at the end and how what has been published feeds back into narratives and for other people to work with. So um, a 2015 volume of World Archaeology was dedicated to reviewing the rapid spread of Bayesian approaches and reflected concerns from a number of period experts and dating specialists that flawed models were being published and uncritically accepted by the wider discipline. In particular the responsibility of the archaeologists to rigorously select and clearly justify the archaeological samples and those inductive kind of, um, decision-making and kind of um, uh, the background how they were choosing different models was set, needed to be set out very, very clearly. And that wasn't always happening in quite a few published papers. So justifying the prior information, justifying the associated information. And, and it was highlighted in that volume that the, need, the archaeologists and statisticians need to work together to refine and to model alternative in, interpretations of the archaeological evidence. So these are on the screen are a list of a few of the issues that were identified, so some of the mistakes that were being made. I'm not going to explore them further here, they're set out very well in that volume and um, much more eloquently by specialists um, in Bayesian statistics. Um, but it's important to note that there are these problems and they're quite widespread. So Alex Bayliss in her um, paper in this volume surveyed 226 papers that were published in peer-reviewed journals and found that only 45% of them had enough information to evaluate and assess the quality of the models. So we've have, we're not starting from a perfect base here anyway, so there's an inherent set of issues there. So this again is uh, something similar to what Maria showed with um, uh, David Clark's diagram, 
It's a spiral of her hermeneutic spiral, which is published by Hodo in his Reading the Past volume. So there are a number of ways of thinking about how we do archaeology and how we conduct archaeological practice. Um, here it's characterised as a spiral, where we start with background knowledge and questions and, and assumptions, and we move through to data retrieval, to analysis, data synthesis, and finally interpretation. And then he says we have these, these temporary settlements of explanation, which is where things tend to sit until someone else comes along and starts questioning again. So over time, older interpretations are falsified, our narratives move forward, they become more coherent as data accumulates, we have new hypotheses, they're formed and tested. So it's easy to see how the radiocarbon diagram that um, Alex drew is, is, can fit into this spiral of increasing knowledge and accuracy. So today's posterior belief becomes tomorrow's prior belief. Another way of conceiving of the archaeological process is provided by Alison Wiley, who notes that scientific arguments are a bit like cables. So this is the argument, there are individual lines of argument that are insufficient on their own, but they can be woven together to make a cumulative, cumul uh, cumulatively uh, persuasive case. So Bayesian statistics provide one way of weaving together lots of different types of archaeological information, stratigraphy, finds, etc. And radiocarbon dates and calibration, etc., etc., to produce stronger and tighter chronologies. So we can perhaps think of these cables a bit like the ones that we know are inside the Seven Bridge. Um, we drive across the Seven Bridge and we're quite happy that those cables are going to support the bridge. But actually, I remember watching a TV programme once where it was showing that they have special listening devices which basically show that inside those cables that little strands of them are breaking all the time. But that doesn't matter because there's so many cables and they're so tightly intertwined that the bridge isn't about to fall down. But they do have to monitor those little breaks and they do have to make sure that these aren't becoming cumulatively um, impactful and, and might potentially involve the bridge breaking down. So a bit like uh, Maria's bridge <laughs> that she was describing earlier. Um, so all of the authors of Bayesian framework monographs would insist that they're provisional and they're interim statements and they're only put out there in order for people to assess them and um, uh, criticise them and come up with better models. But the problem is that once these spirals are built or once these kind of multiple cables are very tightly woven together, it becomes more and more difficult to unpick them. So I've got a picture here of um, oakum pickers in uh, Southwell Workhouse who are um, doing a task that nobody else wants to do. They're doing a task which is to try and untangle these knotty problems and it's hard work and it makes your fingers bleed and it's not very enjoyable and that's why these poor people in a workhouse are having to do it. Um, so as Bayliss and Whittle noted in their 2015 paper in the World Archaeology Journal, these provisional chronological models do tend to fossilise and become received wisdom because reworking them is so time consuming. So actually our narratives don't become more and more coherent over time, they become more and more complex. And it's um, possibly a problem that we're, we're going to set up knotty problems and, and kind of these um, narratives that look so coherent that it's very, very time consuming and difficult to go back and start to try and unpick them. Okay, so um, I'm just going to describe one case study from my own research, which helps maybe demonstrate this problem. Um, this is, um, sorry, it's not particularly clear on the screen, but this is um, the Dorchester complex of prehistoric monuments in um, Dorset in southern England. Um, this is uh, part of a, um, the green monuments that you can see there are, are middle and late Neolithic in date. Um, and um, Mount Pleasant Henge, which is here. So Mount Pleasant Henge is this monument here. Many of you in the room know it well. Um, and um, it's a monument that has had um, a kind of series of different sort of dating uh, narratives attached to it. So um, this is taken from Martin Barber's uh, report on the aerial survey evidence of the site, but it's a useful way of, kind of giving an overview of the different parts of the site. Um, it's a, a large henge monument um, which has comparisons to Darrington Walls, Marden, other sites like that, late Neolithic in date. It was excavated in uh, 1970 and 71 by Geoffrey Wainwright. Um, and uh, what he discovered was um, a, a henge enclosure ditch and bank. Um, and he, uh, within this stands, uh, this ditch here, this site four, encloses a concentric timber circle. Um, to one side is the Conquer Barrow, which is a large mound, and there are a number of other features um, in, the, in the surrounding area. 
And importantly, there's this palisade, this is a timber palisade um, that was found within the Henge Bank and Ditch. Um, at the time of the 1970s excavations, um, there, several samples were submitted for radiocarbon dating to the British Museum Laboratory. Um, so these included a series of charcoal samples from the ditch terminals um, here at the northern entrance. Um, there were um, some antler picks from the western entrance uh, from the ditch terminals. There was a sample of charcoal from underneath um, the bank here from the old land surface. Uh, there was an antler pick from the Conquerbarra ditch. Um, and there was a number of samples taken on charcoal from the top of the palisade um, and also um, from the Site 4 ditch. So this was quite a comprehensive dating programme for the 1970s. Um, and in his uh, publication on the site, Wainwright describes these dates in quite a lot of detail. He rejects the dates that he doesn't think fit. So the antler pick from the Conquerbarro, um, which comes out as a late Neolithic date, he rejects because he thinks the Conquerbarro is an early Bronze Age monument. We now know that that's quite a good date, probably. It's on a primary uh, antler pick from the primary silts. It's a used antler pick. It's quite likely to actually date that monument. And now we, we do know more that there are late Neolithic ground barrows. So that's an example of a way that, you know, thinking at the time can contextualise and, and give possibly the wrong answer to, to, to kind of seemingly absolute dates if they're not included in the narrative. But Wainwright used the rest of the dates that he obtained to construct a narrative for the site. So um, in brief, the narrative is that the henge, the main henge bank and ditch are the primary um, activity on the site and also site four at the same time. And then the palisade, the wooden palisade is added much, much later in the early Bronze Age. Um, so there are a series of problems with the 1970s dates. Um, a careful review of the stratigraphy and the sample selection shows that some of the samples dated were not always directly related to the events being estimated. So for example, some charcoal from the palisade was dated, but it was taken from the very top of the palisade ditch, and it's much more likely to be dating the fuel that was probably used to burn that palisade than the actual palisade timbers themselves. Other issues with the dates have only come to light after submitting new dates from this site. Um, so for example, the antler and bone dates that, come, um, that were done by the British Museum were, seemed to be affected by some sort of 200 year offset. Um, and I think it's something to do with the pre-treatment being used at the British Museum Laboratory at this time. But basically that meant that Wainwright suggested that the western entrance had been later extended because his antler, di antler dates did not match his charcoal dates. But actually I think it's something to do with the, the dating process at the time. So nevertheless, um, these were a series of dates published in the 1970s. It created a very simple sequence um, and it's provided really the, um, the story that has been built on ever since. Um, Wainwright in his account summarised this uh, monument as the impression is one of increasing centralisation of power in the third and second millennia, culminating in the immensely strong timber fortifications. So he, this is a sort of quite grand sweeping narrative that was, I guess, typical of the time because that was the dating that was available, that was the, the kind of the detail that was available to build on. So um, Mount Pleasant has featured regularly in discussions um, since. Um, particularly um, the first person really to comprehensively examine the evidence and think about it in a more post-processual way was Julian Thomas in his book um, Time, Culture and Identity. Um, he, um, that was published in 1996. He thought that the very lengthy sequence of the monument suggested it, quote, played a significant role in the reformulation of social order in the area. So the construction of the timber palisade was part of a wider pattern of research restricting access and visibility into the central part of that monument, totally obscuring events inside. There's nothing wrong with that narrative, but obviously it was based on these 1970s dates. So more recently, Harris and Sorensen have published a paper in Archaeological Dialogues, um, which also um, builds on the 1970s date to suggest a particular sequence. And they discuss again this long sequence of activity at Mount Pleasant. Um, the construction of the palisade is described as a dramatic change in the architecture of the site which changed the ways in which people could move about the site and which people connected emotionally with it. So as a caveat, obviously these people are working with available dates. And I want to be totally fair to Julian, and I know that he presented a paper a couple of years ago arguing for an entirely different sequence at Mount Pleasant, um, drawing on comparison with other contemporary sites. So we don't always follow uh, the received dates unquestioningly. So as part of my PhD, I've been actually um, uh, working with Pete Marshall to obtain new radiocarbon dates from all parts of the site at Mount Pleasant. So we've got another 25 new radiocarbon dates from the site. Um, I'm still working on this project, 
and it's not completed yet, but suffice to say that the dates do not reflect in any way the sequence that was published in the 1970s and which has been relied on ever since. And so we need to probably radically alter our narratives and our theoretical musings about how the site changed and its relation to other comparable monuments. But the archive material from this site has been sat quite happily in the Dorset County Museum since the 1970s. It was very nicely catalogued, it was all there, set out, it was very, very easy to go in and select samples from. But no one had done it until last year. So I think it's really important that when we're writing our theoretical narratives, and I spoke to Ollie about this yesterday, he said, oh yes, we probably should have looked into that at the time rather than writing about it. We have to make sure that the dates we're basing our narratives on are, are reliable, and, and if there's any way we can push forward research projects that um, can bring forward new dates, and we have to do that before going down the theoretical narratives. So, um, sorry, oh yeah, there's a picture of Pete sampling some antlers from Mount Pleasant um, in the museum last year. So, thinking back to the spiral of interpretation, or the twisted cable of archaeological thought, where does this, what does this redating process do when we look at sites? So, we spiral back down a few rungs, um, and then we try and build up again the narratives of the sites based on more accurate data and more strands of evidence. No doubt someone will come along in the future and take us back a few steps before we can move forward again. The difficulty make sure it is making sure that that spiral is generally heading in the right direction towards more accurate and more precise accounts of the past. So how can we ensure that detailed statistical models of chronology don't become the end point for the beginning of new narratives and questions about the past? Are there such complex these complex models, are they backing us slightly into a corner? Is there perhaps a danger of disconnect between theory and data? I would argue that some of the most exciting current archaeological theory in areas such as materiality and non-human agency and monumentality is not directly engaging with the data emerging from some, some recent Bayesian projects. So I'm being a bit facetious here, but um, potentially it could be argued that there are some, well, I'll give an example, there are some really interesting um, papers being written at the moment about Avery. Um, and uh, there's some papers by Josh Pollard and Mark Gillings on Sarsons, um, some papers by Emily, Emily Van Pils just published something about the clays at the site, and really interesting papers about the materiality and, and the way that people have engaged with that site. Would these be being written, these imaginative, creative accounts, if there was a really good Bayesian um, model for that site? I think they probably would be, but it's interesting to think about maybe the different ways in which our data is taking us and that maybe they might, some, some Bayesian models might stifle the imagination and that people don't feel able to engage with the level of detail and complexity of those models. So I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I'm just kind of making that point as a, a bit of an illustration, really. Um, chronological accuracies obviously allow us to get to that level of detail, which we haven't had before. So if you've got a really good Bayesian date and you can, you can get to the generations and the single events and you can imagine things, um, happening at the same time in different sites. It obviously gives us a way of um, narrating the past in a much more personal and detailed way than before. Um, Alex did this on Monday, if anyone was there in um, the session, uh, on Monday afternoon when she showed what somebody would see if they were walking through Wessex at a particular date in the early Neolithic period. But you can only really do that if you've got a really, really good grasp of all the complexities of the data. And there's only a few people who have actually, like Alex, managed to kind of keep that in her mind and really think that, those things through. So finally, I would suggest we have a duty of scholarship to make sure that we keep that spiral of interpretation moving forward. Archaeologists using Bayesian statistics have to make sure that obviously the information and assumptions behind the models they publish are as clearly articulated as possible, so that, and that the full data sets and the models particularly are available for others to use and adapt in the future. This is so that the data and the narrative can be unpicked and the strands untwisted as easily as possible, and it doesn't become an impossible and daunting task. For those writing more general narratives or more comparative accounts, we should have more than a basic understanding of Bayesian modelling in order to interpret and assess published data and to incorporate this information into our work. As our discussions of the past become more nuanced, detailed, personal and imaginative, we need to be wary about the basic information that we're drawing on in our narratives. Questions should always be asked about the basis for the accepted chronologies of sites and steps taken where possible to construct new dating projects to fill those gaps and improve the accuracy of our narratives. But I think it's not just about doing um, the Bayesian analysis, it's also about making those interesting and imaginative narratives based on those narratives too. So we have to tack between scales, between the minute detail of taphonomic processes, site records, individual contexts, 
and the construction of much wider narratives that link together sites and tell us about regional stories or trends across time.